I've looked forward to this for some while. I, uh, let me start with Charles Parton, whom I just met tonight. What's interesting to me about him is I'm from Maryville, Tennessee, really, which is right on the edge of the Great Smoky Mountains. Uh, in fact, I grew up there in a good family, but some reporter had the, uh, felt it was necessary to write when I was appointed to my present job that I had grown up in a lower middle class family at the edge of the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. And I let things rub off my back, but unfortunately my mother got a hold of that article and I, I called her the next week. She was reading her Bible to gain strength as to how to deal with this slur on the family. And she said to me, son, we never thought of ourselves that way. You had a library card from the day you were three and music lessons from the day you were four. You had everything you needed that was important. So that's how I grew up. And Charles Parton grew up about 14 miles away at, in Sevierville, Tennessee. And one of the interesting things about Sevierville, Tennessee is there's another Parton who grew up there <laughs> whose name is Dolly. And many of you may not have known that, but you can now ask him how he and Dolly uh, get along. <laughs> Thank you for the honor of, of being here, uh, being here today. Uh, I'm honored first because these are the Ashbrook lectures. John Ashbrook never did anything halfway. Uh, President Bush described him as one of those rare individuals would rather stand alone in fighting for what he thought was important than compromise his beliefs. And President Reagan said, John Ashbrook knew that the first duty of public life is to responsibly speak the truth, even if the moment's fashion is against the truth. So I'm honored to be here for the Ashbrook lectures. I'm honored equally because it was F. Clifton White himself who asked me to come. To be exact, Cliff White told me to come. <laughs> so I did. I imagine there are no more than a few thousand people in this country who are in the same shape. Uh, they have gotten accustomed to doing whatever Cliff White tells them to do. I have a special reason for that. Uh, when I was setting out on my first political venture, in 1973 and 74, I had in mind I wanted to be the governor of Tennessee. Cliff was already a national hero, the engineer of the Goldwater Movement and many other things. But it was 1974, it turned out to be the Watergate year. For a Republican, uh, my timing was just about as good as Caesar's on the Ides of March with about the same result. I got killed in the general election in November. But I won the Republican primary for one reason in 1974 in Tennessee. Cliff White was helping me in a rather unexpected way. It was like traveling with Arnold Schwarzenegger to Republican caucuses in Tennessee. They all came out to see Cliff, and then at least a majority left and voted for me. And it began my political career, and I'm indebted to Cliff for that. We've remained good friends. I've admired his devotion to politics and good government and especially to young people in this country. He has young disciples everywhere uh, interested in government and politics. And Cliff, I'm not so young anymore, but count me as one of your disciples. I'm proud of you and proud to be your friend. I'm also glad to be back in the academic setting. For a little while, I was president of the University of Tennessee after I was governor for three years before the president interrupted my time there, and it was perfect preparation for all the indignities that go with public life, being president of a university. Uh, for example, the first day I was on campus at the University of Tennessee, a faculty member literally walked up and said to me, I was very enthusiastic about my job, she said, my goodness, you're enthusiastic. You remind me of Clark Kerr, who had been the president of the University of California. And I said, well, thank you very much. How is that? She said, you know, he arrived and left the same way, fired with enthusiasm. <laughs> and a little later in the afternoon, another faculty member came up to me, and she had heard a book I had written about the time our family spent in Australia read on national public radio by a fellow named Dick Estelle. 
She said, oh, Mr. Alexander, I so enjoyed hearing Dick Estelle read your book on National Public Radio. Thank you, I said. She turned to walk away and then turned back to me and said, you know, I just love Dick Estelle. I think he could make the telephone book sound interesting. <laughs> so I'm perfectly prepared for public service in the president's cabinet and whatever indignity may go with it because I've been a university, a university president. I'm a little bit like a preacher who, who when he gets up wants to preach the whole Bible but knows he has to pick a chapter. And, and the whole Bible in my case would be to to say what I usually say, what I said today in Orville, which is to tell the remarkable event that happened last Tuesday night when 2,900 communities hooked in by satellite technology to the largest electronic town meeting we've ever had in this country. This is maybe what Ross Perot had in mind a few months ago, but this was the America 2000 satellite town meeting. More than 2,500 communities, many of them in Ohio, working together toward the six national education goals, and the only way we'll ever reach those goals, and that is community by community by community. You know, it would be nice to have a commander in chief of schools and of drugs and of families and of all these things that make us anxious. It would be nice to be able to pass a federal law have a couple of task force meetings and go explain a result in seven seconds on the evening news, but things don't work that way. Presidential leadership on issues like education have more to do with setting agendas, making things happen, mobilizing communities, using the prestige of the office to move this country in ways that it is only thinking about moving, but needs to move in. Uh, and that I would submit to you is what the president has been doing. In Orville, we were there to celebrate an A-plus for breaking the mold to, to reach national education goals. Uh, in that community in Ohio, uh, they have about 400 members of the communities who for the last year have spent countless hours literally reinventing their school, knowing that they had to get the whole community involved to do it. You can't just dump it on the teachers. The family has to take its part, the community has to take its part, and Washington can't do it alone. So, if I were preaching the whole Bible, so to speak, I would talk about the first national goals in history, the more than 2,500 communities working in the largest town meetings once a month toward those goals, about the 700 design teams who responded, as Oroville and others did, to create break the mold schools, about the efforts to create higher standards in math, science, English, history, geography, arts, civics, and a national examination system. It would be voluntary, but at least you would be able to choose it in your community to see if your children are learning what they need to know about this subjects in order to come live, work, and compete in the world. And, and, and about our effort to do some other things which haven't happened quite so rapidly. They're happening faster in Ohio, thanks to Ted Sanders and Governor Voinovich, that is getting government off the teachers' backs, deregulating the schools, trusting the teachers more than somewhat at a distance to use your tax money to help children learn to these high standards. And then one other area, which is the chapter in the book that I want to preach about tonight, and that is something that is not happening as rapidly as it needs to, that is the most controversial and sometimes acrimonious part of the discussion about how we need to change our schools, that is usually misunderstood by most of the people who talk about it, and that is the idea of giving all families more choices of all schools. What I want to talk about tonight is parents who want the best for their children and the idea of a president to help that dream come true. Specifically, I want to talk about President Bush's proposal for a GI Bill for Children. The idea of giving $1,000 federal scholarships to the child of every middle and low income family in districts that choose to participate. The parents must be permitted 
to use that scholarship at any lawfully operating or elementary or secondary school, public, private, or religious. Up to $500 of each scholarship could be spent on other academic programs on Saturday after regular hours or in the summer. I'm convinced that this proposal, which is before Congress, is an absolutely indispensable part of the future of American education. It is time to give parents consumer power, dollars to spend at the schools of their choice. Consumer power is the muscle that parents need to create the best schools in the world for our children. In America, especially during the 1990s when the whole world seemed ready to follow our principles of freedom and opportunity and choice, the idea of giving middle and low income families more of the same choices that wealthy families already have would seem to be a non-issue. It would seem to be something we would salute at the beginning of the day right after we salute the flag. It would seem to be a plank in every party's platform. Yet it's the most divisive issue today, one of the most, at least for me it's the most. I get into more arguments about it every day than any other thing. Most divisive issue in American education. I can go into a editorial board meeting in a big city and begin to relate the President's America 2000 education program, talk about the national goals, the break the mold schools, the higher standards, the better tests, the getting government off the teachers' backs, and find myself consumed for 50 minutes of the 60, discussing with newspaper editors about what might happen if all parents were actually given more choices of all schools. Many leaders of the teachers' union, many leaders of education management, many others who care about children, turn absolutely blue in the face over the prospect of this and regularly pronounce that such steps will absolutely destroy public education in America. This is an absolutely remarkable development to me, and I, I try to think of how this could be true. I have a cousin, Hazel, in my hometown of Maryville, who may be like one of your cousins. She is the self-appointed family historian. And she collected $25 from each of us several reunions ago, and we thought we might never see it again, but out came a red book with all there is to know about the Alexanders. And toward the back is the story of my grandfather, Drew's great-grandfather's school in the late 1800s, 1870s or so. First they created the church, then they created the school. And he went to school for four years, uh, usually three months a year, learned reading, writing, and arithmetic till about the third grade level. That's what most children did. When my grandfather had children, he made a decision. He sold the farm and moved into Maryville so my father and his brothers and sisters could go to a better school, in that case, a better public school. My grandfather wanted the best possible education for his children. Bill Clinton's parents drove him into Hot Springs to go to a Catholic school. They must have wanted the same thing in that case, a better school for their son. Every parent wants the same. Pick up any newspaper. In the Nashville paper, it will say area two. Buy a home here in the real estate ads. Good schools, people with money make those choices to either move across town to find the best possible school or occasionally use a private school. Parents want the best for their children. Let me talk just a moment specifically about what the President's proposal is because I think generally it's still not very well understood. Here is the idea. A thousand dollar scholarship for a child from every family who makes less than the median income in districts that wish to participate. The President's allocated a half billion dollars for that in the budget this year. That's enough for a half million children. It would be a demonstration project for four years and we could see what happens. Here are some of the choices that might occur. Let's take a person named Maria, age 27. She works at the shopping center. 
She likes her job there, but she's worried about her son David, who's 11. The school board has assigned David to public school 23. Some children there have weapons. The teachers decided David can't learn. The school closes at 3 p.m., even though Maria, a single parent, works till 6. What are the choices that Maria could have? Let's say she lives in a town about the size of Akron, Ohio, where there are about 38,000 children who attend elementary and secondary schools. About 24,000 of those, by our calculation, would be from middle and low income families. Maria's city, Akron, would then receive, through the families, 24 million new federal dollars, enough money to give every one of those children the $1,000 scholarship. All of this should sound very familiar on a university campus because about one half of all college students in America today receive either a federal grant or a federal loan, which they may spend at any college or university. In order to receive this money, Akron, or the participating city, would have to agree to open all of its public schools to David, the 11-year-old, and any other children, and to let Maria, the mother, spend the $1,000 federal scholarship at any school or other academic program, public, private, or religious. In Maria's hometown, that would create at least five new choices for her son David. Number one, her co-workers have told her about another public school in a different district where children feel safe. This school is a part of Stanford professor Henry Levin's accelerated school programs. It assumes all children can learn. They slow nobody down. They speed everybody up. These schools stay open till 7 p.m. at night. That suits Maria, the single mother. She likes that better than wondering where David is, age 11, between 3 and 7 every afternoon. With her $1,000 scholarship, she could help pay for the transportation costs that year. The rest of the money would follow David to that public school. The teachers there would decide how to spend the money to make that school even better. Maria could pick David up at 6. The drive home would provide 30 minutes of opportunity for conversation, something not always easy with an 11-year-old. Choice number two. St. Mary's Catholic School, about a block away. Most of the children at St. Mary's are David's friends. Most of them are from low-income families. Only a few are Catholic. The tuition at the Catholic school is $750 a year. The national average tuition at Catholic elementary schools is about $1,000 a year. Two-thirds of the private elementary schools in America are Catholic schools. Choice number three, the same public school the same one David was assigned to by the school board. Let's say the district superintendent notices that Maria and other parents are leaving. He calls a meeting. What would it take to keep your children and your $1,000 where they are today? So they start talking about keeping the school open till 7, about teachers who think at-risk children can learn, about keeping the school safe. And they come to some agreement because really most of them would rather go to the school in their own community. And this gives the school an impetus to change and it gives that school new federal dollars to make the changes. Choice number four, a new school at the shopping center where Maria works. The shopping center announces that it will create from scratch on site one of the best schools in the world for children of its employees and their families. It will be very different. Child care for baby, fifth grade for David, language and math for Maria, open from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Now, before you become concerned, that doesn't mean that all children are required to go to school from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day of the year, any more than because the grocery store is open, you go in and sit on the meat counter 24 hours a day. You go when you're hungry. And parents would choose the time of the school that fit the family the best. Having it at the shopping center would would permit Maria and David to see each other more often and would permit the family to be more intact. And choice number five would be Maria may spend up to 500 of her dollars to pay for special academic programs that help David because David has a speech problem. 
So she could spend up to $500 at the public school where he is assigned, and she now agrees is the best place for him, and $500 for after school, Saturday or summer programs at the Catholic school in another part of town because in her opinion, that's the best place for him because of his need with the speech problem. There are a number of arguments that are thrown up to this idea that make it seem like a bad idea, but they all have very good answers. Not enough money, some say, so a lot of money, half billion dollars, and we're not the kind of administration that would go throwing $30 billion at a new program without trying it. Hurts public schools, but all this money can go to public schools if they can attract the students. And I believe most of the money will go to public schools. The Democratic mayor of Milwaukee told President Bush in a meeting in the White House that the GI Bill for children would hurt public schools uh, about the same way the original GI Bill hurt public universities. It helped to make them the best in the world. Helps the elite, people say. That's a strange argument because all this money goes to middle and low income families whose parents then take the money to schools they feel help the children who need the most help. Violates the separation of church and state? Not a bit. No one told the GIs after World War II they couldn't go to Notre Dame or SMU or Brigham Young or Yeshiva or Ashland or Howard. And I never hear about the president of Ohio State going to Congress and say, please give us less federal scholarships next year for our students because a few students might end up at Ashland. That won't wash. Poor families can't make good decisions. This is what I often hear from the editorial boards. President Bush disagrees. He trusts the parents more than he trusts the government. And what about discrimination, some say? The GI Bill money can only follow children to lawfully operated schools. That would be up to the state of Ohio to decide, and there are anti-discrimination provisions there. So there are not many reasons left to object to this idea, except it's a big change. I recall back in the 1980s, when some of us governors first began talking about giving parents more choices of schools. The Memphis school superintendent, who's now the mayor, and who was generally supportive of all of our efforts to try to change our schools, called me to say he simply couldn't go along with this idea. For him, it conjured up memories of the 1960s. Freedom of choice, racial discrimination, he told me. I listened very politely. And then I pointed out to him his own optional schools program, a program in 40 public schools that attracts parents rather than assigns children. The experience in Memphis then was the, these schools were improving their quality. Parents and children were glad to have the opportunity to choose the school they thought was best for the child. I remember the teachers at Graham Wood Elementary in Memphis said how nice it was to have children there who wanted to be there and to have lines of people at the beginning of the school year who actually wanted to be in that school. There were 35 or 40 optional schools of choice. Memphis added a few every year. Many of the parents in those lines were parents who were moving their children from private schools back into the public school system. And on top of all that, after it was said and done, giving parents more choices of the schools saved the school district $2 million a year in the cost of crosstown busing in order to achieve racial balance. That $2 million was spent instead on academic programs. Oh, so that's what you mean by choice, my friend the Memphis school superintendent said. We're leading the nation in that. At least the Memphis school superintendent was tuned in. Most Americans in the 1980s when we started talking about choice simply didn't know what anybody was talking about. We asked the question in the 1985 Time for Results report why not at least give parents more choices of all the public schools children attend? We found that Americans had stumbled into this rut, I would call it. And let me be very careful here. I'm not criticizing teachers who work every day or principals who are trying hard. We're all in this together. But we need to face up to the fact when we fall into these ruts and we need to rethink them sometime. 
This was a system where in each town, one government agency had been awarded the franchise to create the only schools in town, the only government schools, to operate those schools and to tell each parent, unless the parent had the money to move to another school district or to choose a private school, which one school each child must attend. These really amounted to government school monopolies. That's a harsh sounding word, but in fact they are. 15,000 of them across the country. And they too often produce what monopolies usually produce. Schools in a time warp, unresponsive to the needs of children and the families they serve. Frustrating and stymieing teachers working very hard to produce results and too often simply boring children. Only a protected government monopoly could have survived so long teaching shopkeepers arithmetic when to get a job at an automobile plant you have to know spatial relationships, mathematics, and estimation today. Only a government monopoly could have survived so long locking its doors at 3 p.m. and sending children home to empty houses when most of us are worried about drugs, about uh, teenage sex and the results of that, and about children watching too much television. Uh, only a protected government monopoly could continue to pay all teachers the same. When the marketplace demands higher salaries for better teachers, higher salaries for teachers with special abilities, for those who teach particular subjects, and for those who are willing to teach in hard to teach places. Only a protected government monopoly would continue automatically without thinking about it to give teachers contracts which give time off in the summers to bring in the crops. Again, not the teacher's fault, just a system which over a hundred years hasn't changed very much. And most teachers respond very well to the thought that only a protected government monopoly could have almost completely avoided the telecommunications revolution in America, communications that makes it hard even today for most teachers to find a telephone to make a call home during the day. It's remarkable that this would have occurred, that these monopolies would have survived so long in the United States of America of all places. In 1987, our family moved to Australia after my eight years as governor. I wasn't run out of the state, we just decided that was a good thing for us to do. I had been noticing at our dinner table that our children were tilting their chairs a little more away from me each night and more toward their mother. I thought it would be a good thing for us to get to know one another as a family uh, a little better. In Australia, we learned about crocodiles and we learned about the outback, but we learned more about America than we did about Australia. We saw from a distance how creative this wonderful country is. I remember our seven-year-old asking right after we got there, Dad, did we invent McDonald's and Coke too? And I said, yes, Will. He said, that's pretty good for us, isn't it? Coming home through China, Drew and Will and his sisters, I noticed, were making little lists of the things that they could do at home that the Chinese children couldn't do. Live where they please, go to the college they choose, take the job they choose, marry whom they choose. In Russia, uh, we took one look at the automobiles and Will said, they're all the same and not so good. Late one night on the train from Moscow to Paris, uh, Drew looked out the window, woke us all up, and we saw the bright lights and the marching guards and the barbed wire. And we slowed down for the checkpoint at the Berlin Wall, and we got an idea in a vivid way of the freedoms and the opportunities we have in America that in 1987 uh, weren't, weren't available in most of the world. Since then, we all have watched with amazement how rapidly the rest of the world has sought to emulate the principles that are most important to us. Freedom, choices, opportunity. Those are the principles upon which the, quest the answers are being built to the most important questions in countries everywhere in the world. Nothing is quite so much in disfavor in the rest of the world as a government monopoly of important services. Even in Bulgaria, the government is now giving families more choices of all schools, including private schools, as a way of extending opportunity 
and improving the system of education. Yet still in America, we're shutting out progress and closing doors to children. Bill Gratison, who's the congressman from the Cincinnati area, is a senior member of the House Ways and Means Committee. He's principal sponsor of the GI Bill for kids legislation in the House, as John Danforth is in the Senate. He sees a lot of federal legislation from his vantage point on the Ways and Means Committee, and he was asking questions like this. What would happen if we said that all the holders of food stamps could only go to one grocery store in each town? Or what would happen if everyone with Medicaid or Medicare were assigned to go to only one doctor or one hospital? What would happen if we told college students, one half of whom, as I mentioned, have federal grants or loans, that they couldn't go to Notre Dame, couldn't go to Ashland, couldn't go to Kenyon, couldn't go to Brigham Young or Howard or Baylor or Yeshiva with their grant or their loan. Our school boards need to step back and think of themselves differently. As overseers of a system of public education, more like the way an airline looks at its responsibility toward its passengers, American Airlines does not insist on designing and inventing its airplanes. It does not insist even on owning them. It does not even insist on buying and selling all the tickets. Its job is to make sure that everyone who wants to fly has the widest range of choices at a reasonable competitive cost and that the passenger can get from A to B safely and on time. What the managers of public education ought to do isn't so different from that. We should think of the job of those of us who are managers of public education to try to see to it that every single child in America has the broadest possible number of options of the best schools in the world and the best academic programs in the world and help each child enroll in those options to do that safely and to leave those programs learning what they need to know and be able to do to live, work, and compete in the world the way it is today. We should charter new schools. We should contract with museums and corporations, invite them to come up with academic programs. The money should follow the children to, to those programs. There should be and are beginning to be high schools in corporate headquarters kindergartens in banks, elementary schools in museums, after schools and summer academic programs in churches and malls and wherever else in the community, a child can safely and responsibly learn what there is to know and what he or she ought to be able to do. There ought to be opportunities for children to attend a regular school of one kind for part of the day, another one of another kind for other parts of the day, and there should be telecomputer systems linked to the school and the home, which would help to renew the place of the home and the family in the child's education, featuring the family as the child's first teachers. In this wide-ranging, wonderful mixture of educational options and opportunities, which is not so different than what students in higher education already have available to them in America today, we will have to have something like the President's GI Bill for children or middle and low income families won't have many choices. That is why what was going on in Oroville today was so interesting to me. That is why the Bensonville, Illinois New American Schools design team is interesting. The whole village becomes the school. All day, every day, all year. Math at the bank, journalism at the newspaper, physics on the farm, everybody involved. It takes a whole village to educate one child. The next few years will be the most exciting in American education in a long time. We are beginning to understand the scope of the changes we need to make. Just this week, the Associated Press survey showed that federal scholarships, like the GI Bill for Children, that would go to middle and low income families which could be spent at any lawfully operated school, have the support of 62% of the American people, only 32% oppose. That is a significant difference from some of the questions that have been asked over the last few years about vouchers that families could spend. Just as suddenly as that Berlin Wall we crossed in 1987 
fell down one day. Sooner than expected one day, the Congress will pass the GI Bill for Children or something much like it. And my prediction is that it will be by far the single most important piece of federal education legislation during the 1990s. It will create a new and appropriate consensus about how federal dollars can help provide the consumer power that will change our schools and then the funds that will be necessary to make the changes. I have another prediction and a suggestion. The prediction is that the current acrimonious debate, which I run into at the editorial boards about school choice, won't even be an issue by the time our fifth graders, the class of 2000, are seniors. Giving such choices to all parents will be considered to be an absolutely essential part of the American education system, which leads me to my suggestion. And this suggestion, Cliff, is for one of your kids, one of your Ashbrook scholars, one of them who will be coming along in a few years who will be writing a thesis or a research paper, let's say. About the time this should be done would be the late 1990s, maybe a little earlier. The subject of the thesis should be school choice. By then, it will not be a matter of debate. Uh, it will be a matter of history. The colleagues, the other Ashbrook scholars, will wonder about this scholar's selection of such a topic. They will wonder about this strange period in American history when it was national policy to give government monopolies control of the most valuable and important enterprises in town and to give only wealthy families choices of all schools. The colleagues, the other Ashbrook scholars, will be asking, how could this ever have happened, especially in America, especially at a time when virtually every other country in the world was attempting to emulate America's principles of freedom, choices, and opportunity? It will be a real challenge for that Ashbrook scholar at the Ashbrook Center to help his colleagues understand why. Thank you very much.